Welcome to the Soul Seeker Podcast. I'm your host, Sam Cabert, and this year marks the fifth birthday of the Soul Seeker Podcast. I started this pod back in 2019 when I was taking my first steps on the path of remembering. And at the time, the tagline for the show was a journey of self discovery. A year later, it became a journey of remembering. Yet, what I know now is back then I was still seeking. And what I've come to know now is that it's the journey of seeking that brings us the silent, slow stillness of acceptance. And therein lies our own innate wisdom. It's my mission now to eradicate the glorification of hustle culture, as it was my drive in entrepreneurship that led to a greater whole. And that's because I was outsourcing my sovereignty rather than looking within. So let this be your invitation to take a deep breath in and remember that at any time we can shift our thoughts and our feelings to create the outer world in which we wish to live. Soul Seekers, it's time to grow. Let's go. All right. In this episode, we have Jason Noakes, the founder of Promo Pulse, a buddy from the promotional products industry, the industry I've been in for the past 15 years almost at this point. And Jason actually created the new Soul Seeker intro tune that you guys are hearing with this episode and the past few ones and what you'll be hearing moving forward. And he was so gracious enough to offer it. And I'm so thankful. It's badass. I appreciate it. And it it really goes with uh, my metal vibes. And in speaking about that, in this episode with Jason, we're going to be talking about his new album called Rev Level, which this album, for those of you that like hard rock or even metal, you're going to love this album. I think uh, many of my listeners know that I was a metalhead back in high school and I went through a metal phase again just about two years ago after my yoga teacher training of all things. Weird story there. But with that, Jason, welcome to the pod. Hey, thanks, Sam. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks so much for taking the time and be on the show. Thank you for the intro theme song from the new Soul Seeker uh, podcast tune. It's uh, it's awesome. I really appreciate that. And I'm stoked to talk with you today about the creative process because yes, you have your business uh, in the promotional products industry and all this other stuff. And you and I are connecting more recently than we have in recent years. And um, I just, I'm just so fascinated because I didn't know that you are a musician to this level. And when we were talking it probably about a month ago, you're like, yeah, I'm working on uh, my life's work uh, and putting it all in one album. I was like, whoa, that's a lot. <laughs> I'd love to hear about it. So just catch us up to speed for people that are new to you or maybe even know you, but don't know the side of you. Just uh, tell us about your history as it relates to music and being an artist. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I play, I took piano lessons when I was a kid. I like a lot of people and like a lot of people, I did not enjoy it at all. It was, uh, it felt tedious and, you know, you learn to play songs you didn't even know and like, and, uh, but I've always been, even back then I was uh, writing my own song. So I, I, I think the first recital I ever played, I actually played one of my own compositions. And so it's always been in me to write music. And so that's always been the, the part of music that I've enjoyed so much that I consider, you know, play piano or keyboards. And then I taught myself how to play guitar. Uh, those are fun and cool. And I played in bands and everything, but it's, I would, I almost view them now as just tools that I need to create songs. And so, um, but, uh, so anyway, so I, yeah, like I said, I, I took piano lessons for quite a while. Then, um, then I MTV came to our town, uh, and that was, you know, I'm in my early fifties now. So that was like 1984. And so uh, I saw a ZZ top video and it's like, oh my gosh, uh, I need to be playing guitar and not, not <laughs> keyboard. So I got a guitar and, uh, taught myself how to play. And, um, uh, and then started, uh, I, a guy I went to, to elementary school with, uh, he played drums. And so I, we, I went to his house and we were recorded a song that I wrote. And so, you know, so even in the very beginning of playing instruments, I was already 
started to create songs. And so, so anyway, so, uh, so that guy and then some other guys, we had a high school band that was very popular. Um, and then, uh, in a couple more bands and then, um, and we actually released an album of our own songs back to our high school band. And we're just getting released after I release this, I've released this album. And now we have a new song coming out that we actually did together. So 30 years later, we drop a new tune. Uh, so that's kind of fun. And then, um, when I moved to Kansas city, I got in another band and we, we did a couple CDs. We toured kind of regionally and, and did some stuff. And so that was kind of fun. So, but once I had kids, uh, it was just too difficult to play, you know, to two or three in the morning and come home and have to get up at six in the morning because the kids were up and, and practicing. And so anyway, so I quit playing live and focused on songwriting. Uh, and then, um, I, I, I joined an organization where I learned, uh, actually, even though I'd been writing songs for a long time, I actually then learned how to write songs properly and, you know, the pieces and the components and more of the technical aspect and realized I'd been sometimes doing it wrong. Sometimes, you know, I'd get it right just by accident. But, um, so I got better at songwriting and then, um, and I, I, I've always been recording too. And so I, I was fascinated with that, started recording my own stuff. Uh, I got hooked up with, uh, some music publishers. So I have songs and, um, I've been playing TV shows and so I get royalties, just tiny royalties, but that's kind of fun, you know, to hear a song here or there that your song gets on. But, um, so that's fun too, but once you kind of do it, then, oh, I, I did it. And, and so I, and writing songs, most of those are instrumentals and they're in the background and things like that. And so, uh, I just with this album, um, and we can get into this too, but I, I wanted to create something to, you know, with vocals and lyrics and the whole bit. So I'll, uh, I'll stop there at the album and then we can discuss further. Yeah, that's awesome. Thank you for uh, giving us some context there. One of the things that is coming up for me is just art, right? Like, what does it mean to be an artist? Because I think so many people think, you know, you have to be a musician or a painter. It's got to look a certain way, right? And I recently uh, did a Instagram reel about this of, in all of all things, but like cooking. Cooking is a form of artistic expression. You know, I remember being a kid and loving certain uh, cooking shows and then taking the recipe and following it exactly how it was. But I never do that anymore. So what's why I'm bringing this up is for someone like you who just picked up a guitar and figured it out on your own, your songwriting on your own, and then you learned like the quote unquote right way to do it afterwards, I imagine it would be a little... Yeah, you could almost gaslight yourself if you would, right? Because now you have all these different thought forms. And for anyone that's interested in like uh, psychotherapy, there's a practice called internal family systems that's getting to know the different parts that make up the totality of the psyche. And that's where like self gaslighting can come through. So I'm curious what that relationship kind of started to look like for you as you start to learn like the right way quote unquote, the right way things should be as opposed to what you were inherently feeling. And just if you could speak to that a little bit more. Yeah. And I think, uh, yeah, sometimes you can get too stuck in constraints, I guess. Uh, sometimes I, yeah, I, I'm a big believer of, um, being creative, like establishing, uh, boundaries and limitations and being creative within the, that, that realm. And so I think, uh, especially musicians will often, uh, be gearheads and they buy this and they buy that. And, and then if, uh, I'm more on the computer, so you can buy infinite plugins to do this and that. And so sometimes there's a, uh, a, a, by defining some boundaries, you can be creative within the boundaries. And so I'm kind of a big believer in that, but I think as far as songwriting, I just learned how to keep, keep us, keep people's interest in it in, in the song, like what you needed to do to not play, you know, maybe go have too long of an intro or, you know, how to, every time you get to the chorus, how to do something a little extra to keep your attention or to change this. And even, um, I actually learned a lot in the, this album too. I, um, I leveled up my skills in uh, production. I took a cl online class, a mixing class, uh, to get better at kind of my core fundamentals, which I realized were kind of I had learned 
piece by piece and, you know, a blog article here and there. And so I decided to take this course, kind of gave me a level um, baseline that I could set up. So I had a better um, procedure to, and more organized because over uh, 10 songs and, you know, sometimes 50 different tracks, it gets confusing. And, and so this kind of gave me a baseline to uh, make sure I was more organized. But then after I felt I was done with the album, um, I s sought out help from a, a professional music engineer, audio engineer that I met a few months before that. Said, hey, you know, I met you and I took this class from him at, um, at this music conference. And say, would you listen to this and give me your opinion? So, so I thought I was done. And uh, he came back with a whole laundry list of things that were uh, wrong, but they, and there's stuff that maybe you might not even be able to put your finger on, but the end result is way different. I don't, it, it's hard to describe. It's just a feeling almost of when you listen to something that's a song that's not quite right to one that is properly mixed and produced. It just has this, this feeling. Uh, and I, I also truly believe that um, songs, kind of like movies, can be made uh, made or uh, broken in the editing process. The same with songs. Uh, you can, if you don't have the mix right, you can just ruin songs. And so, so anyway, so that was interesting. Uh, so when you say, you know, when I learn, it's not so much um, like rules you can't break. I just, I learned some of the things that we as music listeners just don't even know what they are, but we just, it, it just, it's just this kind of natural thing that you assume and expect, uh, both on the, the, the arrangement and the songwriting and then the production. Got it. Yeah. Thank you for explaining that. That makes sense. And especially when you're working with, um, I believe you said producer, but it's, or someone who's mixing and that it knows more than we know, or, you know, right. That we're going to value what they have to say. Uh, another way I'll, I'll approach this subject, because I think it's important for people to understand this is like, even when you're, you're sharing your work with your friends or colleagues that you value their opinions, whether or not they're musicians, and they have a take on something in your art, doesn't have to be this uh, album specifically, where you don't necessarily agree with them, right? Like, because art is so subjective. Like, how do you approach that to your decision-making process if you're going to change something or not? Yeah. Well, I have two two particular examples. And so, one, I gave, I before I sent the album to the professional, I sent it to some friends and one Phil. Bill Petrie, I'll shout him out. Bill has been uh, extremely helpful in being, uh, giving me constructive criticism. And he said, you know, he made sure that I knew that I, he wasn't going to hold back. And so anyway, so Bill had a number of things that uh, was off about the mix that you, sometimes you're so deep into it. I mean, I probably, I probably spent a year on the mix and probably listened to 75 different full versions of the album. And so Wow. It just takes, it takes forever to, to do this. And so you're so deep and lost in this that sometimes you miss certain things. Uh, the best example of Bill, I don't know if you realize it or not, but the song that he keeps telling me is his favorite was the one that he didn't like the first time he listened to it. And so, and so I kind of took what he said and figured out what he meant, you know, how that actually correlated to the, what was missing or different in the mix and, and kind of figured that out. And then as far as when I had uh, David Taylor is the name of the guy that helped me out with the final mix and he's done lots of albums and things. And so he gave me some cool little tips and tricks that like I never even thought about or knew to keep a listener's interest across the whole album because it's different from mixing mm -hmm. individual songs. But when you want somebody to listen to the whole thing, you have to do certain, um, you have to keep their interest across the whole album, not only in addition to a song. And I never had thought about it that way. And so that was pretty cool. But he, so I, he gave me a number of suggestions and there was one I pushed back that like, this is why it is like this. And this, this is, I will try to make it, uh, I understand what you're saying. I'm going to try to make um, a tweak or something, but it's kind of an artistic choice is why I did this. And so, so, I mean, it's, it's ultimately up to me. Right. But, uh, but there's sometimes that you, you do something for a particular reason and it, because that's how you that's how you hear it in your head and that's what needs to to be the final product. 
Yeah, exactly. Because it's it's very much like a gray area and thin line. And, you know, it's uh, I think of Rick Rubin, you know, I got into his work and his podcast and even his book. Yeah, I'm sure you're a fan. Yeah, he's my favorite yeah. producer of all time. Definitely. Yeah, absolutely. And just hearing him talk about like the artistic expression and creative <laughs> process and how it even relates to spirituality one of the things that I've found from that's kind of like a through line with uh, what Rick Rubin says is to be true to you. And I'm paraphrasing, I'm just using my own words, but it's like create the album, create the song, create the book, uh, make the dish, whatever the thing is that you want, right? You know, it's so easy for us to be like, well, it should be this way. Or I think people that are within my demographic or whatever, right, would like it to be this way. But really, when we can produce the best art is when we are being true and authentic to ourselves, and it's something that we would want. And when I hear him talk about that, I'm like, damn, yes, that that resonates like that's something that really lights me up, you know, so simple. That's how Rick, that's yeah. the three of Rick Rubin. He's a uh, you don't know exactly know what he does, but he does something because the final result is always better than you've ever heard for an artist. Hey, I think that's that's it right there. It's so simple. You know, even at the end of my medicine ceremonies, what I always come back to is like, it's so simple. It's so simple. As humans, we just tend to overcomplicate it. It's just so easy for us to overcomplicate life in general. Yes, I totally agree. All right. So talk with us uh, about the album. The album's called Rev Level. It just I know you have an amazing website that speaks about the creation of the album. Like you went all in on this thing. Like, let's go from the beginning with the inspiration. Let's hear the whole story. All right. Yeah. So, um, so like, like Sam said, I built a whole site. I kind of, this, this album took four years to, to make. And so, um, I felt I needed to honor it uh, properly. So I built a whole website and kind of described the process and, and, you know, there's a handful of people that will find it interesting and they'll, you know, to, to see what it actually takes to do something like this, because it was an enormous amount of work. And so, but the, the album idea actually started in, I think, 2012. I kind of had that, this idea to make the Great American Rock album, you know, you have the Great American Novel and, but my version is music. So it was like, okay, I'm going to, I want to create an album that's like, you know, I, I, I value album like there's so few albums that are good every every song you know just from start to finish and so so i wanted to try do to do that myself and that's um you know it's a tall task right and so so anyway so i had like a number of risks i had like five i rough ideas that uh, i kind of came up with maybe over a year period 2012 2013 and then um you know, then I didn't do anything with them, but I kept, I kept producing, I kept making music and releasing stuff. Uh, but for whatever reason, I held on to these, these riffs. And so they were, they were really good, you know, but I never did anything with them. And, and, and so when the pandemic hit, I had a lot of friends that were producing, were doing really creative things, right. With their free time. So one, one friend had, was doing a painting every day and posting it to to social media and, you know, people were doing all these amazing things. And so I, I, you know, it's like, I want to do something too. And so I was, I like doing collaborations with people and, and doing remixes and doing different things like that. And so I reached out to a number of friends and, you know, everybody was on their own timeline and stuff. And so I remembered the, uh, this album idea and decided to kind of unearth it and find the riffs. And so I, you know, I copied all those files over into a folder and I just named it Rev Level. I had that name actually since 2012, 2013. So that, so I've been paying for a domain name for 10 years, right? For this, this vision, because I had thought about it. It's like, oh, I'm going to write this album and then it's going to turn it, I'm going to get some other people to join me. And then maybe it becomes a band and we, you know, it becomes more than just these songs. And so, um, so, so when I decided to go after this, I, I, I kind of found those riffs and I just, I immediately gave, started giving them names. Uh, the original idea was, um, or titles to the song. And so the original idea was like something, some sort of loose drive theme. I just bought a, like a high performance car. And so, you know, I was thinking about that type of stuff. And so, um, and so I, I went ahead and gave titles for these five songs 
And then, um, then just gave titles. I think I came up with titles before I even had songs of like what I want to talk about. And so then I just started playing riffs and coming up with things and trying to piece together and make songs. And, and I would oftentimes just, uh, sit down and record, um, you know, just a bunch of riffs and then I cut them and paste them and drag them together. And then eventually I got, um, I wanted to do 10 songs for an album. Uh, and I had nine, I wanted to do nine originals. And then I covered the Billie Eilish, um, you should see me in a crew, which the first time I heard that a long time ago, I thought that would, this would be the most awesome, heavy song. And so that's been stuck in my brain for a long time. So I decided to do that one in addition to my own songs. And so, um, as I kind of outlined on my, on the website, you know, you get to this point, it's like, okay, hey, I got them. And then it's like, oh crap. You know, I just have the music and, and, uh, that the process almost just starts right then. And so, uh, so anyway, so I developed the music and then for this album, um, I did something I've never done ever. And I, for all nine original songs, I created the melodies in my head taking walks and I never recorded them like the ideas anywhere. And I'm very, very bad about remembering anything that I create. I can't play. I could not probably play you any, hardly any of the songs on the album because I've already recorded them. They this leave my head. And so the, the thought was, it's like, okay, if I can create melodies for nine songs and all are different, you know, between nine songs and I can remember them all nine songs, then they must be somewhat catchy, right? You know, if I can, retain the melody in my brain for that long, uh, you know, they must be good enough that at least I can remember them. And so I got that done. So I, and then it's like, oh, great. You know, and then it's like, oh crap, I got to write lyrics now. And so what do I talk about? And so I, you know, I tried to keep some of the themes maybe from the original titles. I already had titles. So then I was, came up with ideas to something to talk about loosely based on the title, but then I, the other thing I had to do, which is super difficult is then I had to write lyrics that match the phrasing of the melodies that I came up with. So I had no lyrics at all for any nine songs. So I had to come up with lyrics that matched the phrasing of all the melodies for all nine songs, of course, or whatever. And so it was rather challenging and I, I, I'm not a lyricist. I don't, that's my least favorite part of songwriting. And even listening to songs, I rarely pay attention to lyrics. And I know that's, I think you're kind of a lyric person or a melody person I've heard. And so I'm definitely more of a melody person. So, so I gave myself a pass. It's like, if I can come up with lyrics that I can live with, you know, they don't have to be Bob Dylan. They can just, like, if I can just live with them, then I'll let them go out in the wild. And so anyway, so I got to that point and, uh, so, so that's it. So I, you know, I said, Melodies now, lyrics, I had the music, and then now that's just the songs are done. Now I have to record all the songs. So um, I'm going to take a break. Do you have any questions about that? And then I can. <laughs> yeah, it's the full process. I love it's it. It's, a, it's, heroes, it's the hero's journey. Um, I'm sure you're probably familiar with the hero's journey arc model. Yes. Yeah, 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 and for most people listening, you're probably familiar with it. If you're not, look it up. Uh, Hero's Journey. You can Google it to see all the twelve steps. Pretty much every movie is based off of, uh, or story is based off the hero's journey. There's an incredible documentary which I'll link as well in the show notes called um, uh, "Finding Joe." It's. Have you seen that documentary, Jason? I'm not. It's so good. It's all about the hero's journey. But the hero's journey is basically like we're the hero of our own story. And at some point, we're going to have a call to adventure. Then we're going to refuse the call. Then we're going to meet a mentor. And then we're going to go through the underworld with all these tests and allies. till eventually, like, we get the elixir. Or, like, we, uh, we slay the dragon. And then we come back to our home and bring the medicine or whatever we have learned and alchemize it with our community. And what I'm hearing is like, this has been a 12 year process. I mean, obviously it's been your lifetime, right? And we could get into esoteric type philosophies and say lifetimes, right? But we'll keep it simple and grounded and say a lifetime of work that kind of culminated in the past 12 years or so. And you know, there's got to be highs and lows. There's got to be times when you're ready to throw in the towel. Like, could you speak to that at all? That's coming up. 
<laughs> so perfect. So yeah, so the recording process. So I, I have the songs. Now I got to make. They need to sound good. I need to re- actually record them and you know to get them ready to release to the world. And so, so I went through the whole recording process with you know it's all guitars and no synths or anything on this album. It's just straight on metal hard rock guitar. And so I, so I recorded all that. That's um, not one of my favorite parts of this whole process because I have to play everything good, you know, and not perfect, but I have to, you know, I got I have to get something that I can stay in for the rest of my life. Cause once the song is released, you can never change it ever again. So it's pretty permanent. So you have to make sure it's, it's right. And so I, uh, so I went down, laid all the guitar work and the bass work. I don't, the drums, I are not, I didn't play the drums. They are uh, um, this system that I have where I can get nice, great sounding drums. I kind of mix and match and I build the, I build the song from different pieces and parts so that that's easy and it's recorded well. So, but I had to make sure the guitars are sound great, all that. And so that was tough. I even, um, for the solos, I mean, this is a hard rock, right? They, they have to have great solos and good solos. And so I actually stopped and kind of worked on, you know, I haven't played, I don't play a lot anymore. So I kind of practiced, to, which I never do. And, you know, tried to learn some new solos to get some things going through my head. And so, and then to be honest, I, I, there's some recording trickery, you know, I actually recorded several and pieced some of those together and I had to do several things to get something that I would felt worthy of the song, whether I could actually play it completely or not. So, so I know that's blasphemy for some people, you know, purists and, you know, that's what it is. I, I'm more, I want the best possible song I can produce, whether it's all me or partially me or trickery or whatever. So, so anyway, so I did all the music and that's what I'm comfortable with. Um, then I thought, okay, I'll try to sing and I don't sing very well. And so I, I, uh, lay down a couple of tracks like, oh my God, this is terrible. This, this, these songs need big voices, right? They need, they need a singer that can complement the, the big guitars, right? They, you need to have a big voice on top of these big guitars. And so I quickly realized that I'll never, ever be able to sing these songs well. And so I thought, well, this, I start, the more I thought about it, it's like, well, this might be fun. You know, I, like I said, I consider this kind of my, uh, it's not my last one I'll do, but you know, I figured this is my magnum opus. This is my lifetime achievement. So it's like, it'd be fun and cool to have people from my lifetime you know, sing on these tracks. And so, um, so I have everybody from, uh, my original high school bandmate. He sang on a couple songs. He sung, sang on, uh, many other songs back in the day, but so he sang a couple, uh, two songs were sang by, um, the singer in my, uh, high or my, uh, Kansas city band. Um, there was another guy sang a couple songs that was he was in bands when my other band during high school were playing. And so I, he, he's got a huge voice. Uh, another friend that I met at a music conference laid down a track. And uh, Dave Schultz, you know, from Common School, if you know, David, uh, he sang back up on one of my songs. He's done that several times over the years. Um, and then uh, the guy, if you've ever heard the uh, Speaking of Podcast theme songs, a promo up front podcast with Bill and Kirby. Uh, the guy that sang on that, that I hired for that, I hired him to sing one of the songs on my album to kind of piece together. And then I have, um, also I have a, a duet with my AI artist on the Billy Eilish song. So, so anyway, so it turned out pretty cool, you know, that obviously lengthened the process because everybody has different things going on. And so I had to coordinate all these people to sing tracks and work with them and to get everything laid down. And so, um, so anyway, so I got all that done. And as I said, then I mixed everything. I took a class to learn how to mix better. And then uh, I thought I was done. And then, no, you're not. <laughs> you got to, these things are good. And uh, and back to that that story with hiring David or to do that final analysis of the mix. Uh, the, one of the coolest things he did was kind of give me permission to touch the mixes again. Because you get them to a certain point. If you just tweak one thing, you can throw off the whole thing and have to almost start over. And so, but, but his changes were, these changes were subtle, 
but they affected the whole thing. And so basically allowed me, gave me permission to go back and kind of do a couple more things that maybe I was going to let go that I wasn't going to let go. So, so that's, that's, we're all the way up to, uh, getting ready to release. Got it. Cool. So you mentioned, uh, like you hadn't been practicing and you had to start uh, working on new solos and get the creative juices flowing again. You know, for many people, we can just feel creatively blocked. And I recently in the past few years have been getting into flow states. And I used to have this story because I'm a big creator and artist in my own way and very different than you. I mean, I could tell you stories of how I try to pick up a guitar and it'll make you laugh. But anyways, though, going back to flow states, I used to burn myself out. And when I'm in a flow state, I would go, you know, I don't love saying 110%, but above 100%. You know, for me, it felt sometimes like 150% if I was to give a number to it, right? But other times closer to 100%. And then I would have this crash. So then it was almost like, oh, I don't know if I want to get into the creative zone because it takes me several days, sometimes a week or even longer to get my energy back. Then what I learned in the past few years with flow states and being able to get in and out of flow states better is, or more efficiently, I should say, is when you're about 80% like at capacity in that flow state, it's very much the opposite of the David Goggins mentality. And I love David Goggins and I love tapping into that inner beast when we need to, right? Which what I'm alluding to here is like when you're ready to quit, which he speaks it to physical uh, fitness, but really what he's talking about is mental fitness. And this applies to being an artist as well. When you're ready to quit, you still have 40% left in the tank. And sometimes we just need to unleash the beast and activate that, right? But other times, especially what I feel as an artist is noticing when I'm at 80% uh, capacity and then exiting from that creative expression so that I can re-enter it because it's not a crash state with uh, flow states. It's actually a recovery state. So having said all that, I'm curious like to unpack it a little bit more when you are feeling creatively blocked. Like what are the things that you can do to help get the creative juices flowing again? Yeah. Um, again, I kind of, yeah, I have, you know, I have always have a lot of stuff going on. And so i actually thrive when I have probably just limited time to do stuff. And so So like, if you go all the way back to when I was telling you those original riffs were written back in 2012, that's when I had a job. I was at Distributor Central and, um, you know, it was was stressful. I had a lot of things going on. And so what I would do, those, those riffs, uh, I would come home at lunch because I, it's in the same town. I would eat and then I'd come down and say, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to play five, I'm going to come with five riffs in five minutes, right? And I would just lay down one track, whatever came out, you know, put, I'd put up a beat, then a riff, open up a new track, lay one down, lay one down. And, and once I hit five and, you know, I kind of, again, I put this boundary. It's like, okay, it can either be a time limit or a number limit. Um, I often do that with like for promo pulse. I will, um, if I'm working on an idea. I will sit in a chair over here and say, okay, I'm going to fill out, I'm going to come up with the entire sheet of paper of ideas, right? I'm either, I'm either going to get done in 30 minutes or I'm going to fill this sheet up, whichever one comes first. And, um, and I just find that helps me get in and out of flow states, you know, because I just, I, I got to get it done. And, um, and if I have too much time, then I dabble around and I don't end up doing anything. And so, uh, for actually trying to come up with ideas that works really well for me, um, I go into a total flow state when I am mixing. And that's one of the, you know, they always say the things that you love are the things where you don't realize what time. And so, as, you know, as you can tell, I, you know, I, I'm pretty structured with all the stuff I do because I don't, to get everything done, I got to make sure I'm utilizing my time. But I cannot touch any like mixing stuff during the day or I won't get anything done because I will. I'll just, it'll be gone before I know it because I just get so in the weeds and 
I just, that's the part I love the most is the, is the production. And, and, and I always, I call it almost finding the song. Sometimes there's a song within a song and you, you sometimes can stumble on these happy accidents or you cut something or you move something. And, you know, I do everything on the computer. That's my job and everything is computer based. So that's how I think. And that's where I'm most comfortable at. And so, so a lot of times, you know, you'll, I'll start like dropping, you know, like you'll mute a track and see what it sounds like without the guitar on top or no, no bass here, no drums and, and cut it. Or if I, I cut, copy and paste and do this twice or whatever. And sometimes it's like, oh my God, this is like, there's a different song here, you know, um, to me at least, you know, from what I maybe heard in my head and thought I was recording. And then w- once it comes out, it's like, oh, this is kind of different. So, so anyway, so, I, so that's probably the two ways to get in and out and do something quickly. I, I, def- I set constraints and, and just say, I'm, I'm going to see what I can accomplish in this set amount of time. And then when I go to the things, uh, mixing the other one, I get lost in is Photoshop and doing like a, like album artwork and different things. I'll just be lost, you know, because I, for whatever reason I really do. So, so it's, it's just trying to, to know what those are, right. And make sure you give it adequate time so you can enjoy it and, and, and let things come out. And so, um, so to me, it's like two different, two different, entirely different processes to, um, to, to get the best out of me. So initial ideas is more or more like just see what I can come up with and get it all out as quick as I can. And then, then uh, the other side of it is to let it breathe. And then that's kind of what makes it the final product. Yeah. That, that time to let it breathe is, uh, so important. Uh, It's cool that you use that, that adjective of breathe, because typically in the past, I would say marinate. And recently I've been saying breathe, especially with my new book coming out, uh, all about breath work and I've given it that time to let it breathe because you're right. We get too close to it. Uh, for everyone listening, please, please make sure you, if you're not already listening on Spotify, open up Spotify if you can, if you're not driving or anything. And what's the best way for them to find the album, Jason Noakes or Rev Level? Uh, yeah, it's a, yeah, both. Either one of those on yeah. Spotify and streaming service. And again, I built a whole website. It's revlevel.com, R-E-V-L-E-V.com. Yeah. And, and so- you guys can... We'll get all those links in the show notes so you can click the show notes as well just just to get straight to the album because I just want to point out for a moment, like check out the artwork on this album. It is so cool. And I know a lot of people listening to this episode uh, know my buddy Alex Ruiz. Alex Ruiz is an incredible artist. His style is kind of similar, similar to Alex Gray. And um, just the the fine lines there, it's just so cool. I'll, I'll put Alex Ru- Ruiz's art in the show notes as well so you guys can check that out. But definitely listen to the album. That's what it's all about. So, Jason, yeah, please continue on with the story for sure. Yeah, so, okay. So, um, so I have it ready. Um, I'm going to get on my listening uh, for a year probably to mixes and you, know, you hit milestones. You talk about you know the ups and downs, and so I, you know I remember the first time that I actually had all ten songs together that I could listen to at the same time. That was exciting. And so there's all these these points that you get to that uh, you know then then when like when David said you yeah, well you need to change all the stuff. It's like oh so you go back up and down, and you had to learn. I had to learn a bunch of things, and and um, which is fine. Then I come out of it much stronger, right, or much better artist at all different things but so um because this album uh, this was just such a big process and a different process and and it was important that i was really trying to make something that i would enjoy if i stumbled upon it right yeah i wanted a full album and and so um like i said i wanted to honor that by maybe uh, telling the story around it and so uh, I already had the domain name, and so I thought, oh, I put up, I'll put up a site, you know, just as a kind of a touch point to where I could put some links and stuff. And it, it just it, kind of like the mixing and stuff. It just it, it, it launched into a whole other project unto itself. And so I just re- 
I realized that as I would start writing and and kind of thinking about how this this panned out, it's kind of like this podcast. It's like, oh, there's just these these big steps that that you know actually had a lot of depth to each step. And so I started making pages about that. I have pages for all the all the songs and and so the artwork, um, you know, in Promo Pulse. We've been doing AI stuff before AI blew up. And so I've always been fascinated in using uh, AI and machine learning and things like that. And so with the advent of all the image generation and video generation tools, uh, this gave me, um, you know, something to, a reason to, to, to work with these things. And so it, it, because we had the website and then I had the idea of doing a Kickstarter right now to try to raise money to do a vinyl release. And so if it's going to be on vinyl, you know, when you do album covers for streaming, they're little and, you know, you kind of pump these out and you, like I have some behind me. So you make something that looks cool and it's like, ah, make a JPEG, you throw out there and you're done. Well, with this, it's like, okay, if this is going to be a vinyl album, now it's got to be high res, got to be, got to stand the test of time, right? You know, I'm so, so I'm trying to make an album that stands the test of time. That's the best I can make. So, so it's like, oh crap, now I got to make the artwork has to stand up to that too. And so that actually added a whole nother, probably two or three months of, of, uh, work and, and trying to get, I decided I wanted to use AI. I, you know, this is a personal project. So I wasn't, I didn't really want to spend a bunch of money hiring somebody. And I, I certainly can't create something that magnificent. So it's like, okay, let's see if I can get AI to, do what I want it to do. Right. And that that's not as easy as it sounds. And so I had, I had a vision in my head, what I wanted it to be that didn't come out. And then I asked it, you know, what, what, what would you interpret the word rev level, you know, and that was interesting what stuff came out. And then I, uh, but I still didn't find the cover. And then at, I was also building the site at the same time. So I decided, uh, I wondered what it would happen if I fed the lyrics into, uh, to Dolly to see, interpret these lyrics. And so that was fascinating. So, so each on the website, each song has its own page and the, the image, the banner image is the interpret AI's interpretation of my lyrics. And so, so I thought that was pretty cool, you know, so it's, it was, so each one looks wildly different because every song is different. And, um, so that's cool. So I kept building the site, but I still didn't have the cover. And so I finally got, got something to come out. I finally stumbled upon. You know, I had this idea when I originally created the album, it was all about like driving and whatever. And then, you know, you have hard rock and music. And so I, so I, what finally got me over the hump with AI is I asked it to give me its interpretation of when RPM meets BPM and that's all I gave it. And it started to spit out some cool stuff, right? It's like, ah, awesome. And so I had one that I really liked and to the point where I was about to pull the trigger on this, like, like, this is the cover. Right. And, and then I thought, well, maybe I need to get some, ask some people, right. You know, so maybe I need just mm -hmm. the music. Maybe I need to get some outside opinions on this. So I started asking around and I had one friend, uh, Jeremy, uh, who's, who sang on a couple of songs. He really pushed me. He, he it's always forcing when you have friends that will tell you the truth, right. And give it to you direct and not just say, yeah. oh, great. And so, um, so he really pushed back. He just said that, you know, this, what I had didn't, he didn't feel was to the level of, and the depth of the music. He just thought it, I was shortchanging, uh, what, what I produced music wise, he thought I could do better. And so it's like, it's kind of like when, with the mixing, it's like, a, I get back to this process again. Yeah. And so I had some other, um, so I, I, I sent him some other, you know, I had it spit out. I don't know how many different designs and I kept some of them. And a lot of the, if you go on my site, the, through the process, the, the banner image throughout the process are the, the ones that came up with prior to the album cover. And so, and they all had a different look and feel and stuff, but there were a couple that were kind of line drawing ish type of things, but were real simple. Right. And, uh, one of them for whatever reason kind of caught his attention, say, Oh, see if you can run with this one. And so that's that. The simple line drawing came out, ended up as what it's got, uh, album cover ended up with it, it spit out and I, so I fed it this image plus gave it more information and, and eventually just spit out the, what ended up with the cover. It's like, oh my God, this is amazing. This looks like a, an album cover and the, and the, 
the funny thing is too, the, there's like little spokes of where my, my name and then rev level, and they actually have like the exact number of letters and the thing mad. I mean, it was like, it was made for, for this. So I don't know. It just, when it came out, it's like, oh, here it is. It's like, you know, it just, you just hit on it. It just felt right. And it looked cool and it had depth and you can look at it and try to figure it out. So, so anyway, so that, you know, that was the, that, that end up each one of these steps, you think you're done and then you end up at, tacking on two or three more months because you, you're trying to get to that last 2%, right? You're trying to get, if you really want something that is, you know, the good to great, all the, you know, all, every book you've ever read, but getting that last little thing is, you know, that's, that's the part that takes the longest if you can, if you can make it through that. So, so anyway, so, uh, we did that and then I, um, I've always been, I wanted to do a Kickstarter just to see what it was like. And so I thought this was the perfect time I've done, um, CDs and I've released tapes. I've never released a vinyl album. Um, my kids are, you know, they're 20 and 17. And so they're all into vinyl, you know, that's the thing that's cool now. So I thought it'd be kind of interesting to see if I could, um, you know, promote this thing. So that, you know, that's the next step. It's like, okay, album's done, artwork's done, everything's ready. And normally you just hit a button, it releases the world of streaming, you know, that's, I've done in the past and it's done and you move on and you do other stuff. But then now with Kickstarter, you know, that's a whole promotion. And, and I, I was just telling my wife this morning that the Kickstarter, if, you know, either way, if it funds or doesn't fund, um, is fine either way, uh, really it's given me an excuse to promote the album and people are listening to it. And then I'm having people tell me, you know, it's only been out a couple of days as we record this podcast and you know, people tell me they've listened to it several times. And so like, you know, that, that was the intention, right? Almost is like, try to, try to build this site, you know, let people know how serious I am about the, the album, do a Kickstarter. But it, to me, the, the biggest, the biggest reward is just people listening to the, to the music. Absolutely. And that's what's so cool about it, because it, like you said, it's going to live on. Right. And I mean, I know I experienced this with my books and different things as well, where someone will say something from years previous. I'm like, oh, wow, that's cool that that's still making an impact. Right. And there's one thing that you said that really stood out to me. And it was uh, normally you can push a button and then you move on to do other things, whereas now you're focusing on the Kickstarter. And that's such an important point to bring up that when we bring our art and we share it with the world, there's almost like a grieving process in a lot of different ways, right? Could I see you nodding your head, so I'd love to hear what's coming up for you. Yeah. You mean about the grieving pro or what the being done? Well, basically like, yeah, being done because, so here's the thing, like, in yogic philosophy, there's a concept called sadhana. Now, this is not groundbreaking or anything at all because it essentially means to be in the pursuit of, you know, it's the cliche saying it's about the journey. It's not about the destination. What brought me to the spiritual path was I was always focused on the destination. And I was like, okay, I did that. I achieved that thing on to the next one, right? And it's a very, it's trap that we can fall into right? Because it's just, I admire you so much for taking 12 years to, to release like, this album. Four years. What's four that? Years. Four years of focusing on it, but it, the idea was 12 years ago. So don't make, sounds I, like what? democracy. <laughs> you know, it. well, here's the thing, just to uh, relate it to you. I wrote my first three books uh, in less than a year. The first book, it was like, after I wrote that one, I was like, oh, well, I could write another because I, I was move on to the next thing. And I was like, oh, I can write another, like I figured this out. And then all of that kind of led to my numbing depression, spirituality, all that type of stuff. That was 2019. When I first did ayahuasca plant medicine uh, for healing for the first time, this message of soul life balance came through. This was April of 2019. Very much like you during the lockdowns, I looked around and what my lens of perception showed me was everyone was writing their books right and i was like 
oh, well, I had this idea in an ayahuasca ceremony for Soul Life Balance, the book. I was like, I should start writing it. And then there was this voice that came through, more of a thought form than a voice that was like, but it's not ready yet. And I just listened to that. And it was so uncomfortable for me to be in. And very similar to you, like 2012, right? That's when you first like had the idea or started to work on. Same thing for me in 2019, I started to work on this book and message of Soul Life Balance. But my version of waiting, it, because I, I'm someone who, who moves so fast and I'm needing to learn to slow down, was about three years. It had been mirrored back to me that I was at this 12th step of the hero's journey cycle. And I was like, okay, now I can write this book, right? So that's kind of what I'm talking about with the energy of moving on to do other stuff because there's a certain level of like grieving because we're so excited for to share it with everyone or we're so excited about the process. Maybe it's the mixing, whatever it may be, the challenges, all of the things. It's like, okay, well, now what? Like, I would not be surprised if I hear from you in the next year or two where you're like, oh yeah, I'm working on my next album, right? You know, because that's kind of my point here. Like, what is the move on to do other stuff after the Kickstarter? Yeah, so I, I have several things. One, um, yeah, the move on thing. So I have, like I said, I have songs that are, are um, played in TV shows and stuff. And so I actually sat down and, and decided in one hour, I gave my one, one hour, I was going to create like think of, record, mix, and release a song to for this music publisher that so it actually made royalties and stuff and so so talk about you know the extreme I, I wondered if I could do it in sixty minutes come up with something from from zero to finished um, and so those type of exercises are cool so you're moving on in perp on purpose and then my so I, I mentioned I had this AI artist that I created so I could experiment with. Uh, AI and music and do different things. And, and that, that project's very much to allow me to get in and get out. So do a song and then, and then I move on to something else to, to satisfy that. Cause I think there's, you know, sometimes you want to do that, right? You don't want to work on an album for four years and then go do another album for four years. You know, you need that, you need that instant gratification loop also. Um, but for this album, so, you know, this is a big thing. And so I actually, uh, so I'm going to get done with this and whenever the Kickstarter, whatever that result is. And then, if, you know, if it funds and I have to ship all those things out, so it's going to pro prolong this experience. But then I already have plans for, for two more albums based on this album. So I'm going to release a instrumental version. Um, my, I have one album on Spotify in particular that people love and I hear often they'll work to it, like code and do stuff. Cause it's like, heavy rock driving What's the name of that one uh that's under car chase music and so that was that's the yeah. Uh, yeah it's a got a yellow cover it's on spotify so it, that that one um that was kind of another period of my life where i was kind of focused so many people told me that my music sound reminded of car chase car chases so i kind of i niched down on that and had a website and so when i was really big into uh, with the publishers and trying to sell music and stuff i kind of focused on that that uh, that idea because it gave people an instant idea of what you know type of music I was developing, developing car chase music, and so um, and then you know I said I kind of got away from that over time, uh, but then I kind of honored that period of my life by giving it a whole compile it on a whole album. So anyway, so I hear often uh, and I in my software uh, circles that I run in developers made a comment one day when I said I was working on an album and say, we need to release an instrumental version so we can work to it. And so, so anyway, so I'm going to release an instrumental version. I'm going to, um, to keep it, it kind of exciting for me. I, I'm dropping the, the cover tune, the Billie Eilish tune. And I, I, when I was digging, researching for the website, trying to find when I, you know, I wanted to be kind of accurate. So, so like I tried to find when I initially created stuff, I found a whole nother song. <laughs> that I forgot I had as part of this process. So I'm going to, it was almost done, which is a, a it, I just need to mix it and stuff like that. And so I'm going to release that as the 10th song for this instrumental and called Dev Rebel. And so, and I already have, the cover that was rejected uh, for the first one that had, did have some popular, I'm going to use that for the instrumental version because I still like it a lot. 
And so I'm going to use that one. And then I also do a lot of, um, I like the heavy rock stuff, but I also do like, like synth based stuff, more up tempo, aggressive synth based, all synth based stuff. And so I'm going to take, since I have all these great vocals, I'm going to see if I can make a, make, remake all the songs, uh, keep the vocal tracks, but then redo all the music underneath of it. And so that's, that's a, that's down the road. You know, I, I, I I'll need to take a break and do something different. <laughs> you come back to that one. Cause that, that will be another big process, but. But so this thing will kind of live on its own. I even joked on the website that there'll be, you know, by the time I'm done with that, then it'll be time for the 10 year, uh, re-release <laughs> remastered or whatever, you know, so I can just keep going with it. So, so I, it'll be back in, in certain forms, definitely. So, but in the meantime, I have my AI, AI guy and, and, uh, I mentioned I have work right after the Kickstarter's done, then I'm going to release the high school band song. It's pretty cool. It's got an awesome cover that I I got lost in the flow doing that too. So, so anyways, that's kind of, so I think there's a place, you know, to, to, to answer your question, I think there's a space for both. Um, in fact, with this album, I was kind of starting to impose deadlines on myself. You know, it's like, well, I need to get this out. You know, I've been working on this forever. And then I just told myself, you know, the, the, especially the mixing, this is the part I enjoy the most. So why would I not continue the process till I felt it was done? Why would I? artificially stop it when I actually enjoy it, you know, just for some arbitrary deadline that doesn't matter to anyone. Nobody cares. Nobody even knows that I'm doing this. And so, uh, so I gave my, basically gave myself permission to, like you said, let it breathe and let it just keep just listening to it and just tweaking every last little thing that nobody, you'll never hear. And anybody listening to this podcast will, would never even hear if I played you the, the, uh, the incorrect version, but, but I heard it. And it bugged me and so yeah, yeah. I'm not going to let it go. And why not, why not just make it keep working on it until it's, until I can listen to the whole thing and not write down a note or make a, make a note in my phone. It's like, I need to change the symbols are too loud or just some arbitrary stuff. Yeah. So, so, but it, I think it's such the, a, you need that, you need that instant gratification too, sometimes also. So you gotta kind of, I think you gotta balance both of those things. For sure. Absolutely. And the deadlines is such an interesting thing because I, I find that that happens with me a lot where I'm like, I'm just putting more pressure on myself. And now this is a stress or a job and this is no longer passion and art. And I think that's when we can potentially for some of us lose our integrity in forms of uh, our, our, our artistic expression. Having said that, I think there's a lot of artists and there's a lot of people that don't have that more masculine or yang energy that could really benefit from the arbitrary deadlines because they just sit on it and they don't release it. And at the end of the day, like it really art is meant to be shared. There's an incredible book I was reading recently on a plane, and I don't know if this has ever happened to you or the listeners, but I was like halfway through the book. It was one of my favorite books I've read and while underlining, taking notes like all over the place, then I must have forgot it on the plane or somewhere. So I went and bought a new copy and I haven't opened it up since then because it's like, oh man, now I got to start over, right? You know, I feel like I need to start from the very beginning and take notes all from the beginning. But uh, that book is by James McRae. And this goes to show I'm not uh, reading the book currently because I know the colors, uh, but I don't remember the name of it, but it's all about the creative expression. So as an artist, so if you guys are interested in that, by the time this podcast is edited, you can find that book in the show notes. It's incredible. That said, Jason, this has been awesome. Congratulations on the release of Rev Level. It's a badass album. You know, those of you that are into rock in any form, you will appreciate if you guys love heavy, if you love throwbacks, the kind of glam 80s, you will dig this. I am a fan of it. Uh, like I told Jason before this, uh, I'm just getting over cold, so I could only listen to a few songs because I'm like, oh, my energy isn't there right now. I, I need to be 100% back to, to really be in this because right now I need soft. <laughs> but um, Jason, thank you so much. I'll put all of your show notes or all of your links in the show notes so you guys can connect with Jason, connect with the Kickstarter, listen to the album, share it with your friends and all the things. Awesome. Thank you, Sam. I appreciate it. It's the fun.